Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Has the way that love has arisen in you seemed out of place or even taboo? My mission is to expand the conversation of love in the world. Is it possible to have deep, loving, healthy relationships? Have you ever been curious about having more than one relationship or partner at a time? Get ready to transform in love. Be courageous and set yourself free. In this show, we talk about relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. I shed light on things that are not always talked about with conversations about expanding love. The Elizabeth Cunningham Show starts now. Cunningham show. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cunningham, um, and we are courageously expanding love. And uh, a little quick note before we begin: uh, this show happens every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, so make sure that you come and check us out live, or you can uh, catch the replay on YouTube or any place that has podcasts. Really, I think it's like almost any place that has podcasts now. Um, so uh, make sure that you. Uh, hit subscribe, like whatever the button is on the whatever platform that you're using to make sure that you can check out our show. All right, and welcome to our episode. I'm so excited. We have Chad Spangler here today, a Polyam fam. Yes, (laughs) the crowd goes wild. (laughs) And in this episode, we're gonna talk in depth about how toxic masculinity um, impacts non-monogamy, normalizing difficult conversations, and other criticisms about polyamory. Yay! Hi, Chad! Amazing. Hello, I'm super excited. <laughs> oh my it's god! It's been a while since I've done any sort of podcast or anything like that, so I'm excited to do it again. <laughs> uh, well, I'm just overjoyed to have you here. Um, uh, finally followed up on all of my messages and was mm-hmm. like, Chad! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm the worst at following up on messages, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> My, my DMs are an absolute nightmare. <laughs> it is all, I'm pretty sure I sent you the DM and it was like, it had that like the, the face emoji that has all of the swirls for the face mm-hmm. where it's just like, ah, yeah. like that's how I feel about my DMs is like, ah, yeah. I don't even know where to start with this. Right. I've kind of yeah. given up on keeping track of them because it's, if I did that, it would literally be the only thing I did ever. Like, <laughs> Do it's, else. it's absolutely true. All right, I'm going to fangirl you for a little bit, and then we're going to go into toxic masculinity. So uh, everyone needs to check out Chad, um, the Polyam fam on Instagram. Um, and I think you have a YouTube channel now, yeah? I do. I'm looking yeah. to get more consistent on that. I have some video ideas, but I've been uh, kind of pedal to the metal on TikTok recently. So <laughs> I've gotten a little distracted on that. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am. Uh, I have one real special video cooking up for the next few weeks uh, for my YouTube channel. That's going to be a little spicy. So <laughs> Ooh, I'm excited. No, actually. So I was um, uh, I, I taught like I, I do I have to fangirl you for a second because me and my play partner love your videos we like send them back and forth like he'll send me a message and he'll be like have you seen Polly Amphib's new video <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I told him, um, I saw him this uh, this past Saturday, and he, I was like, guess who's going to be my guest? And he freaked out, so he's really <laughs> excited. <laughs> well, hello to the both of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but now let's be serious. My fangirl moment is over. Um, what What is, let's just jump right in. What is toxic masculinity? And I feel like that's like, when I say the words toxic masculinity, that's like the question that I get is either people get upset about it first Mm -hmm. um, or they're just like, what is, what do you mean by that? What does that even mean? 
that's that's kind of the reaction I get too when I say toxic masculinity is people <laughs> assume that I mean that you know all men are terrible and everything about being a man is terrible but that's not really what it is you know it's right. about those aspects of being a man that are you know negatively affect you and the people around you um you know this things like the aggressive territorialism that a lot of us have been taught you know just our entire lives um, our attitudes towards women, towards, you know, uh, um, towards the LGBT community. There, there's so many aspects that we've all kind of grew up with, even, you know, conservative areas of the country are, you know, notorious for this, but, you know, there are certain things that happen just everywhere that we grow up and we kind of take, we kind of take for granted the things, the negative things that we learn about what it is to be a man throughout our lives. And that's that's what toxic masculinity is. It's not that you should just be ashamed for being a man, be ashamed for your gender, although sometimes we are pretty terrible. Uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, not about like people though, yes. like regardless of your gender, like you can be a shithead, you know? Like- Yes, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and toxic masculinity, in my opinion, is there's there's so much when we talk about toxic monogamy, well, you know, just kind of the aspects of like how you own your partner, how like you are everything to each other, like, you know, stuff that, you know, should really be examined. Uh, I feel like when you peel back the, the curtain on that a little bit, like 80% of toxic monogamy can kind of be traced back to toxic masculinity, which in my opinion is harder to deal with because like monogamy to me at least, and I, to a lot of other people is like a thing you do, whereas masculinity is a thing you are. So that's like a, a much harder thing to tackle for a lot of men. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, uh, you know, masculinity is, and inside of this conversation of toxic masculinity, where it is really performative, like it's something that you've learned, it's something that you now act upon, um, and that there's a difference between toxic masculinity and just masculinity, right? right. And because there's, um, like you can, you know, there's the masculine and the feminine, which doesn't necessarily have to do with gender, Right. But there's like, you can right. be masculine and you can be more feminine. And I think when we start talking about toxic masculinity, it's those traits that we, you know, mostly, you know, men, like boys and men have learned right. where it's like, you're supposed to be this way. You're supposed to act in a certain way. You're supposed to be territorial. Like you're not a real man if you do X, Y, and Z. And so then that's why it becomes toxic is because it becomes this like have to or performative or like almost forced sort of thing that you have to be. Right. right. Exactly. Nail on the head. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's your, it's your almost like putting on a show and you're taught, at least I can only speak for myself, but you know, I was taught, this, oh, there they go. There they go. <laughs> Hello, um, doggos. But I was, you know, taught these things so aggressively that the act kind of becomes who you are at a certain point. You kind of forget your acting and it just becomes your behavior and it's, and yeah. it becomes very problematic in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah. So why is this, you know, how is it problematic and why is it important to talk about? I mean, um, I think the, the, maybe the why it's problematic might be inherent in what we just said, but, right. you know, <laughs> so, so maybe it's why is it important to talk about? I think it's important to talk about because we can do better, right? We can, we can kind of uh, re rethink what masculinity means to us and kind of dissect those toxic parts of it and try to move in a better direction. And I think that's really important, not just for us, but for future generations, because a lot of this stuff has been learned generally, generationally, you know, uh, is passed down. Well, my, my dad was this way, so I'm this way, you know, and right. certain things. So I think it's very important to break that cycle and kind of redefine what masculinity means in a way that is uh, a lot more positive moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you, I mean, I have, I have so many questions about this, um, uh, but I think, you know, what would be more positive? Like my, I'm trying to put these two questions together is mm -hmm. like, how would it be more positive? And also how does it impact polyamory? So there's kind of like this, it's those moving parts where it's like, how does toxic masculinity impact polyamory? Mm -hmm. And then also like, 
in having it be better, then how would that impact me? So I guess it's more of like a three-step, three-step question. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, as far as, as far as uh, how it impacts polyamory, uh, where do I start? Um, <laughs> because we all kind of, uh, even dating in general, not even necessarily polyamory, but just dating in general, um, you know, there there are stereotypes of just, you know, a woman goes to like, try to like online date, for instance, and the response is just a torrent of terrible men trying to <laughs> flood their DMs and such. Uh, and that very much spills over into polyamory because, you know, a big part of masculinity is like, if a woman is not exclusive to a man, then, oh, that woman is you know, in, in a not good way, easy and like an easy target to like prey upon like dating wise and men kind of take that and run with it. And again, like these, I am being like very gendered here and kind of speaking in stereotypes, I admit, but you know, it's, there's a reason they exist, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's so common. Um, and I, I know personally from myself and from uh, men I've talked to that we go into non-monogamy, you know, thinking it's going to be not necessarily the easiest thing in the world, but, oh, this is going to be great. And then all of a sudden, these things we were taught our entire lives about what it means to be a man and, like, have, mm -hmm. you know, ownership over someone else smack us right in the face and make everything so much harder when we, you know, for especially for people transitioning from monogamy to polyamory. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think the transition from monogamy to polyamory is such a huge learning and growth experience. And it's that, um, uh, oh, shoot, I'm going to forget the, the name of it. But there's like the um, the thought where it's like when you're new at something mm -hmm. that you're like super confident about it. Cause you oh, don't know uh, anything about it. and Kruger effect. Is that it? Yes. That's yeah, what it, yes. Go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, when you're new at something that you're like, oh, I'm going to be like, this is going to be so easy. And I'm really good at this. And you have all of these like fantasies basically about it. And then all of a sudden you start to actually do it. And you're like, all of the shit just comes up where you're like, yes. actually I suck at this. Yes. Um, and it's like kind of that plummet of confidence, but also that's the learning curve where then you see where, where are you falling short? And I do think that especially men coming from a culture of toxic masculinity, going into polyamory and creating these relationships, that's absolutely like a thing that you have to be confronted by. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And toxic masculinity can affect like how you even, you know, go about these relationships. A lot of people come into polyamory for very wrong reasons because of toxic masculinity, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back from the break, I want to dive a little bit deeper into what does this actually look like? Like, what are these difficult conversations mm -hmm. um, that you have to have in order to, uh, you know, see the negative impacts of toxic mas masculinity and also to then translate it and go into healthy relationships? Like, there's like a whole journey there. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that when we come back from the break and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love, and we are here with Chad Spangler, and we're talking about toxic masculinity and how that intersects with polyamory, and in the last segment, we talked about what is toxic masculinity and, you know, why is it important for us to be talking about that, and what are some of the impacts that it has on men in particular, and now we're moving into, you know, what is the impact that, yeah, it has on men, and now how does that impact men who are transitioning into from monogamy to polyamory? You know, what do you have to confront? Like, what are the difficult conversations that you have to have? Yeah, the, the absolute biggest, I can think of one giant elephant in the room that is caused, in my opinion, almost entirely by toxic masculinity, masculinity and that is the one penis policy. Um, we, you know... As, as men are taught that, as monogamous men are taught that if, you know, your woman is, and again, this is a very cis hetero sort of like <laughs> caricature, um, is, you know, even interested in another person, you're like failing as a man, right? 
Um, so, so many people, uh, men go into, uh, a non-monogamy with this idea of like, okay, well, I'm okay with my, my woman partner, you know, dating, seeing, doing whatever with other women, but not other men. Um, mm. because we've been taught to be so territorial, right? And that's a big difficulty with men, even men who don't want that you know, myself, I'm including myself in here. I never wanted that from the onset. I, I just, that never felt right to me, but at the same time, it was still very hard to overcome the issues that come with that because, you know, whether I liked it or not, I was more comfortable with my, you know, partners with other women and not men. I didn't like that. Like I could see kind of where I wanted to be, but it was <laughs> like, I couldn't force myself to be there right? Yeah. Because of all of these things that I had just been taught my entire life, especially coming from like a small rural town. Um, and it, it just makes everything, everything hard. It makes, you know, equality in uh, non-monogamy so much more difficult to just accept and get into. It's, I mean, it's still, it's always an ongoing process. It doesn't just go away, you know? You're not totally transformed. You're not a completely enlightened human being. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I try, I try. You know, I think I think trying to be that is more important than actually being that because I think that goal is kind of impossible. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of the the idea that there you have a commitment. You have a commitment to to growth, and what is growth but an ongoing process? You know, a horizon that you can never reach. Right? It's just mm -hmm. always always out there in front of you. But it does have you strive to be better. And I think that what you said was really brilliant where it's like you saw where you wanted to be. But I think the other really key important thing that you just said was that you were able to admit where you are now. It's like, oh, yeah. I see that <laughs> I see that this is like the be the quote unquote better option is mm -hmm. to like be okay with this. Um, and like, these are all of the feelings that are coming up for me. And in my experience, you know, because when I first um, uh, started practicing polyamory, I hadn't come out as queer yet. So basically, I was just dating men. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was the thing that I experienced personally, and that now I see professionally is that it's hard. It's hard to admit that there's a shortcoming there. And I almost even like, even in my heart, feel bad saying shortcoming, mm -hmm. you know, because it really, it, it, and to be fair, it's not even necessarily a shortcoming. It's just, you were conditioned in a certain way. And now because you were conditioned in a certain way, you have these feelings and now you have to deal with these feelings trying to be a new way. Right. And that's another, and that's another piece of toxic masculinity that hurts the whole process is that men are often taught to bury their feelings, to not express how they feel, to, you know, keep, keep that shit inside, right? <laughs> Deal with it. You got to just man up and, you know, stuff like that. So that, like, that's a whole nother element of toxic masculinity that makes, you know, this, it's, it's kind of a vicious cycle in a way it, you know, elements, you know, these negative elements of toxic masculinity make the other parts of toxic masculinity that much harder to overcome there's just like so it's it's so ingrained you know <laughs> right it's a system that has very yes. well protected itself yes yeah and it's yeah. very hard it's extremely hard for a lot of men and I've you know talked to men who have had those same issues of just ah oh, I'm mm -hmm. like I I'm not you know I I don't I want to be comfortable with other men like I know it's not fair or you know I know my partner wants that doesn't want to be limited in the genders they can you know uh date but i i just can't ah, i can't get there you know i can't like i'm just like something about other men like you know just triggers all of these emotions in me and it makes me feel like i'm failing it makes me feel like i'm just bad that you know i'm not worthy or something like that you know yeah no thank i mean and thank you for like really spelling it all out like that because you know that is that's that's what you know men are dealing with that's that's also what i see as well and you know one of the things that i share with my clients is that you know there's a difference between you know your rational logic and your emotional logic oh yeah and so you know we can beat ourselves up all day long about like the rational logic of something when really 
what we need to deal with is actually the emotional logic. But like you said, you know, there's kind of like that trap of the toxic masculinity where it's like, well, you can't feel your emotions. Right. And I've even had, you know, uh, men who've come to me where I'm like, well, how do you feel about that? Mm-hmm. And they'll say like, well, what I think, I, I think this, da, 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 or like, well, this happened and it, you know, they'll talk about the action of something or the thoughts of something, but like, don't even have the language because right. you haven't been taught that. And you haven't in like, knowing and feeling your emotions is actually a practice yes and I'm (laughs) I'm so glad you said that because I have active I've had to actively um kind of practice this whole even in my conversations I will have a conversation with a partner and I will say okay logically I know this is what is going on but this is how I feel about it and they do not they do not coincide right now and it's it's Mm -hmm. causing this weird tornado in my brain that like I just can't deal like I know what I'm feeling isn't necessarily like the logical but it is important to take that step and to you know you know rationally you know think about things Mm -hmm. in, in in that like logic brain but also to just dig into okay why does my emotional side like feel this way and it is a practice you kind of you have to make a routine of it it's just it doesn't just happen you know yeah absolutely um and so what are some of the other difficult conversations that you um see or hear you know coming up around this you know, we talked um, about one penis policy like what else comes up um a lot of kind of ownership oriented stuff mm-hmm. right like uh be, even beyond one penis policies like invasive sort of like needing to know details that you're not necessarily entitled to because it's not your relationship, you know, but because, you know, you've been taught, like, I have to have control over all of this, that I need to know every single detail of these things, right? And that's really hard to let go of. I mean, obviously, communication is important. However, you know, you're not necessarily entitled to every little tiny bit of information about other people's relationships. They're not yours, right? Um, But I've I've seen that cause problems uh, with myself and other men. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, there's just so much that's hard to deal with because, uh, of, of what we've been taught, like to, like you said, bury your emotions, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I grew up in a very masculine environment. You know, I grew up in, in the Midwest and I was, you know, the only girl in my neighborhood and like grew up with the guys and like all this stuff. And it really wasn't until I was like 29 where I really was like, okay, you know, I, I started, um, dating who, who is now my current nesting partner. Um, and they were like, you never tell me how you feel. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to make, and we created a game. We were like, okay, every once a day for this whole week, um, I am going to say how I feel about something. And I realized that my feelings vocabulary was that of a five-year-old because that was the last time that I had expressed my feelings openly. And I was like, so I could say things like, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm upset. And then my partner would be like, well, what does upset mean? And I'm like, I don't know, upset. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so like not even having like the full vocabulary. So it really does when you start to take on this practice that, you know, it takes baby steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I know like surprise, like this may be surprising to a lot of people, but um Thanks. Thanks, Holly. Um, (laughs) It may be surprising to a lot of people, but my social media followings, my demographics are overwhelmingly women. Um, You know, it's not men. And every time I make, you know, some kind of video, some kind of post about toxic masculinity or, oh, this, there's this, you know, you know, even I, I have like a stereotype, like a caricature of a toxic masculinity, like person, a man. Um, and, you know, the women, both the men and the women, but especially the women who date men, uh, relate to that so hard. I even say in my descriptions, I'm like, I know this is like kind of an exaggeration, and people go, No, 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 it really isn't. But it's like, not though. <laughs> but it's not. It's so not though. Yeah. It's like, and in my experience, it's it's so it's average. Yeah. Like in yeah. my experience, <laughs> your caricature caricature is like, yeah, like that. I know that guy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 
and, and I know that guy. That's why I, I can do that guy is because like I've seen it, right? Like right. I've seen it online. Sometimes I see it in person. It's just so overwhelming, like just everywhere. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of why it's hard to because then you have even when you're working on yourself, even when you're trying to, you know, overcome these like jealousy issues that are caused by toxic masculinity or just your mm-hmm. feelings in general, you have this entire, like basically the entire culture is kind of working against you because they're like, no, you're not supposed to feel that way. They, they, mm-hmm. You were right before. Don't work on yourself. You know, <laughs> you're not making it better. This is the way it's supposed to be. So that just makes right. it that much harder and that much I- more isolating too. Yeah, definitely. And uh, what I want to, uh, and we're, we're going to go on a break here really quick, but um, what I want to talk about as well, because I really do think that it is really isolating. And like you said, it's like, it's this system that kind of protects itself. Yes. And so, you know, you have the people who are kind of outside of it, like the women who are, you know, dating the men who are a part of that, mm-hmm. right, where they really see that because they're the ones who are being impacted by it in right. such a huge way, right? Right, Absolutely. And so when we come back, I wanna talk about, you know, what is, um, what is normalizing this conversation even look like? And I know that that's a huge question to mm-hmm. tackle, but I really wanna know, like, let's, let's talk about that. What does normalizing this conversation look like? What is it going to take? And then how will that impact, you know, polyamory? And we'll kind of get a little bit more into that. So all of that after the break. So we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love, and we are talking to Chad Spangler about toxic masculinity, about normalizing difficult conversations, just like the one that we're having, and how all of that impacts uh, polyamory and building healthy, like, (laughs) how do you go from toxic masculinity to build a healthy polyamorous relationship? And we're going to tackle it all right now in the next 15 minutes. We're going to solve all the problems. Yep, that's the plan. (laughs) All right. Perfect. Got this. Glad you're on board with me here. (laughs) No problem. And go. All right. All right. Um, Uh. (laughs) But really, you know, how, like, you know, we've talked about in the show, um, uh, you know, what is toxic masculinity? How does that impact, you know, men and people? And also, how does that impact relationships? And kind of where we left off was, okay, now we have this kind of divide, like we have this system of toxic masculinity that protects itself. It's like, this is the way that you should be. This is how you're supposed to be. If you go outside of the system, then, you know, you're a pussy or whatever, you know, and, uh, and so it really does, it protects itself. And as you said, you know, you make a lot of um, videos about, you know, what people are dealing with and how they're struggling. And most of your audience is women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah, I think, I, mm-hmm. and I think that's an important part of kind of trying to tackle toxic masculinity is just listening to women because they, I would say, are affected by it the most, Right. Uh, most most men especially cis men are you know don't fully have to um you know deal with the direct ramifications of toxic masculinity they don't have to deal with like all these creeps in their dms all this like all this like treatment they get all the mansplaining all of like all of that stuff so like one of the i think one of the biggest things you can do on an individual basis to try and like just be better and like unlearn toxic masculinity is simply like listen to women right (laughs) because their experiences will tell you more than you thought you could know about toxic masculinity more more than you want to know honestly because (laughs) i hear hear some of these things and i'm just like jesus christ (laughs) like (laughs) i it makes it sometimes i've because sometimes make the joke that I think I could be bisexual, but I look at my own gender and go, no, no, I pass. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> well, it's also like the bisexual joke of, um, you know, more femme people um, mm. that it's just like, oh man, like I kind of wish that I was only into women, you know? Right. Like if, I, if, if, if bisexuality was a choice, why would I choose men? <laughs> I've seen that one and like, like here, here. It's a good one. It's a good one. 
but no, I, and I think that that's a really important, you know, all jokes aside, but I think that that's a really important thing is, you know, getting feedback of the people who are most impacted by your behavior. Yeah. You know, how, Thank what you. is it like being with you? What is it like being around you? How does your behavior and actions impact, you know, the people who are in your life, who you're dealing yeah. with on a regular basis? And I, I know we, we see jokes, like we just exchange or whatever about just like, you know, screw men, they're the worst or whatever. And men will get offended because they feel like targeted. Right. But there's, instead of, I would say, instead of just like having that like knee jerk defensive reaction, ask yourself why these jokes are so prevalent. And there's a reason it's because like so much of this behavior is so common that people are just fed up with it. They're, they're sick of the shit, you know, <laughs> it's like, so they make these jokes, myself included. I make jokes about men all the time, you know, <laughs> as, as a man. That's why I think your videos are hilarious. Like, <laughs> you know, I think, and I think that's what resonates with so many people. Like I, I, I think they, they see these criticisms and I, tr I try to dig, you know, a little deeper than just damn dogs. See that they're, they're consistent. They are consistent. Every, they're get, they they will bark once every segment. I swear. <laughs> but like, I think that's why it resonates so much with people is because I at least try to dig like a little deeper and give a little bit of commentary on like you know the joke of like you know oh this is why people hate men or whatever you know I try to like dig like a little deeper in there and I think that helps people just get it a little more you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I've talked with my, um, so my, my nesting partner, um, also dates men as well. And so sometimes we, you know, when we talk about this, we have this conversation and I'm having this, I feel like I'm having this conversation all the time constantly. Um, uh, but it's, you know, what is the, what's the line? Cause I, okay. You, you, there's like calling people out for behavior, but then there's also the concept of like calling people in. Yes, and like, absolutely. that's kind of the line um, that I see here is like, you know, because there's only so much calling out that we can do before there's a division, right? right there's like right. even more of a division than there already is. And right. like, and we're just kind of, and now we're adding to the system where people are like, well, yeah, I want to stay in the toxic masculinity system because everything outside of that is just like hating men you know right. so exactly. i'll just so i'll just stay in here <laughs> because at least these people don't hate me <laughs> yeah and i think <laughs> i i try to take a, a balanced approach because some behavior in my opinion is just so egregious that there really is no other appropriate response besides <laughs> fuck this like, like you know and just like hating on her or whatever but like there's so much middle ground too yeah. and i think something that's helped me is trying my best when I'm, you know, either making a video or just having a conversation to try and focus on criticizing the actual behavior and not necessarily always the person, because right. sometimes the person is just, you know, I, I, I was there. I used to be that person that had this like extremely toxic, problematic belief, but like they're willing to listen and they're not just, you know, coming out just swinging, being just a total asshole. Like you, you can talk to this person. And I think a lot of the time focusing on the behavior um, it, it is sometimes more beneficial because it doesn't make men feel personally attacked, right? And right. they're just like, okay, I can see why that's shitty. Uh, I, you know, instead of calling them shitty, which just like gets this defensive, just like, no, like I'm fine. Like you're, you're just like you're sensitive. You're a little snowflake. Like <laughs> calling out. Right. I feel like I feel like criticizing the behavior is a way people be like, all right, we can talk about this separate thing. That's not like my identity. Right. 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 No, I think that's an, an amazing, amazing point. And, you know, bringing that into the willingness to listen as well. Yes. And, and I think inside of the willingness to listen is also just recognizing the, recognizing that you have an impact, like step one, recognize that the things that you do and the words that come out of your mouth have an impact, you know, regardless yeah. of who you are, like, I, you know, regardless of your gender. Um, but specifically, you know, in talking about ma uh, toxic masculinity, it's just like, you know, just recognizing that and then being willing to get curious about 
how it's impacting specifically the people in your life. Because I think also with concepts like this, we can separate ourselves. We're like, well, I'm not fully like that, or I'm not totally, or like, I'm not, I'm not as bad as like these people, you know? And so you can, you know, use it to separate yourself. And so I also think, yeah, just getting curious about how, how does that impact you? Okay. It only impacts you in a small way. Fine. How? Yeah. Go find out. (laughs) <laughs> I think there's this, I've experienced this notion uh, that people just think like, well, if it happens on the internet, it's somehow not real, right? Hmm. So that allows this like horrible, like kind of trolly, like, you know, anonymity is just a crazy drug. Uh, <laughs> and, but like, it's easy for people to think in that kind of noisy world that they really don't have an impact, but you hmm. don't, you don't have to change the entire world to like make it slightly better. It's incremental change, right? Your behavior day to day cumulatively will affect other people. And like, you know, everybody doing this together with like trying to tackle these issues will make a difference, even though you might feel like working on yourself doesn't do anything right it does like it it it's not no it might it might not be a world changing thing but you know it doesn't have to be we the change doesn't happen overnight you know it does not well and then okay so let's say all of this happened let's say you know you know people men start to listen start to get curious start to really see the impact of their behavior on you know just even like the five people around you right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be the impact of everything on your life, but it's like, who are the top five people that you interact with on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. And how, how are you impacting them? So let's say that they did that. How would that impact polyamory? Like, again, we're talking about like going from, you know, monogamy to polyamory. So then how would that impact like that transition or like even creating healthy relationships? I mean, I think if if that were a thing that happened in mass that we, you know, <laughs> worked on this, I think men would have a lot easier time transition because like part of the, the one of the biggest issues men have from my experience of going from monogamy to polyamory is simply they start to date and there's no interest. And sometimes they get bitter at women or, you know, they're like, but they don't realize that like other men have caused this. Like there's always a defense up be- because of horrible experiences that women have had. Uh, so I think things would get a lot easier for men because men in general would just be more trusted by everyone. Uh, if, if we like, you know, and that's, I, I think it would do wonders for polyamory because like there that's one of, that is one of the biggest things that people talk to me about is just like I'm getting like specifically you know this is again very I, I hate how cis hetero my stuff my like stuff gets sometimes but you know I, I speak from experience uh, yeah. so, <laughs> but you know the one of the biggest things is just like oh we opened up and my wife is getting an overwhelming amount of attention and I'm getting none and this sucks and I hate it and I'm like well <laughs> maybe if we all worked on just being more more trustworthy as masculine people then that wouldn't be such an issue that we could we can more easily connect with people without having to you know kind of show our card at the door being like I'm not one of the shitty ones I promise <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it does and I I think that that is our that that is the mic drop moment for the show for me is that yeah if you know and again, it's not, we're not talking about world changing thing. Well, we are talking about world changing things, but we're talking about like small actions, Yeah, which is like small actions of getting curious, you know, how do you impact the people around you? And if you do that, it's like, oh my God, you can have this amazing love life, you know, and mm-hmm. we can actually start to impact it. It does. There's a ripple effect. There's mm-hmm. a ripple effect to that. And it's Absolutely. like, yeah. And, you know, creating and you know, trust takes a minute to rebuild. And I think that if we started on this journey, that there would be an opportunity to rebuild trust. You know, Mm -hmm. I might be like the optimist here, but I really do believe that I don't, I never think that hope is lost, you know, like I absolutely believe that we can turn the ship around. Absolutely. It's, it's hard to feel that way sometimes in the the age of the internet where there's just so much negativity, but good exists in the world as well. (laughs) Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, and it is, and it's something that we can actually have an impact on. And I think I'm going to skip this last break um, because I, I want to, you know, I, I love where we're at right now. Oh, and yeah. I also want to go into, you know, what do you, and I also want to have time for you to like, share what you're up to too. Mm -hmm. We're going to, one of the things we're going to do is like, what's Chad up to? How can <laughs> more people get involved in what's Chad, what Chad's up to? Um, and we have an awesome giveaway too, which yes. I'm so excited about. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I've been seeing the pictures online and I'm like, <gasps> I'm excited about this giveaway. Okay. Um, uh, so, but yeah, like being in this conversation um, uh, of literally like, that there can be these small steps, these small incremental steps um, to have it be easier for everyone, not just you, yeah. you know, and it will be easier for you. For those of you who are in it for yourself, hey, this will make it easier for you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Even, even, even the selfish, selfish intentions benefit <laughs> from, yeah. from, from improving toxic masculinity and making it something better, you know. And the thing yeah. about that system that protects itself is once you start especially on a personal level, once you start dismantling like one thing about that system and like realizing, oh, that's not exactly what I thought it was, you know, the other parts of that become like a little more questionable. And it's like, it's easier. It gets easier as time goes on to like recognize these things and improve, you know? Yeah, beautiful. Well, what <laughs> is, I, I, it really is, it's beautiful. And I, you know, I've had to unpack my own, um, like I shared earlier, you know, my own impact of toxic masculinity and how I was, you know, um, expressing that, how I was performing toxic masculinity, like as a woman, mm -hmm. um, and like, and I've totally been, um, uh, I've totally had the moment of like being sexist too. Mm -hmm. Like women can also be sexist. Some yeah. people might disagree with me on that, but it's conditioning uh, that affects everyone, you know, we're all, we're all raised in this society, right? And it's not, yeah. even, even those issues that are primarily like about men don't just affect them, right? Don't just teach them. We teach everyone this. Right. Absolutely. And as you said, you know, like this conversation has been very like cisgendered heteronormative, mm -hmm. but we could have a whole other conversation about how toxic masculinity impacts people in the LGBTQ community and queer relationships and how that shows up. I mean, it, it literally is, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, and I know that talk, one of the big things circling back for a second to like the one penis policy, one of the big things there, the defenses is just like, oh, well, you know, it's these other people can provide something that I can't I have you know I have my genitalia and these people you know these other people don't. and I'm like but did, why is this like you're not you're treating that like the end-all be-all and people kind of use um being queer friendly as kind of a mask to hide behind because they're just like well I'm I'm letting my partner explore their identity right and I'm like yeah but like you're only the parts of the identity that you approve of. <laughs> like, so they hide behind this, like, well, my wife's bi and I don't, I'm not a woman. So, you know, whatever. And I'm just like, yeah, but she's bi. She's not a lesbian. <laughs> like she's just like, she's into both and you're limiting like one, like it's, it's, it's strange, right? Like it, it's yeah. strange how even very, fairly progressive circles can have these issues of just like almost using progressivism to like as a shield to like not have to necessarily dig deeper oh my gosh what that, I, that's a whole nother episode right there <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like see i'm not super shitty i'm only semi-shitty exactly. um, <laughs> don't don't look at the man behind the curtain <laughs> Oh my God. Um, no, absolutely. And um, okay. So as we kind of come to conclusion in our episode here, I want to know, what do you hope that people take away from this episode? Um, I specifically for the men, you know, if you're transitioning from monogamy to polyamory and you're having a much rougher time than you expected because of like, you know, jealousy issues and other things caused by, you know, 
toxic masculinity, how you were taught to be a man, just know you're not alone. Like almost like everyone deals. It is, it is such a common issue that feels isolating. Like you're the only one going through it, but you're not, you know, and we, we can, we can improve in small ways, um, you know, to, to be better. Like, and uh, I guess for, for, you know, non-men uh, just, I <laughs> say I don't know because non-men are doing a pretty good job in my opinion <laughs> like helping with the problem because you know they're they're doing the things like because yeah. you know you don't I, I hear men give the thing of just like oh well just like be be you know be welcoming of this change and like be be nice be nice to men who are being shitty and I'm like I don't think that's a good <laughs> I think there is a time and a place to be kind of mean about it, <laughs> like when it's an extreme thing. Um, but yeah, just like you're not alone. And if you're like, and obviously, I think this is way more common knowledge. I don't think I'm enlightening anyone with this. But, you know, women affected by toxic masculinity and like the result of that, you're also not alone. But I think you all know that. <laughs> that one's that one's more known like the common experience there is not a secret <laughs> yeah that definitely is definitely is a lot more well known and I think that that is honestly like why people you know in the uh, LGBTQ community have an easier time dismantling that toxic masculinity is because we are the ones who are more affected by mm -hmm. it yeah. Um, yeah or affected by it in a way where we can see it rather yes. that that's actually a more accurate de depiction of that we're affected by it in a way that we can see it but it's like when you're in the middle of the issue it's harder to see you know it it's is. harder to see when you are a, when you are the center Yes, absolutely. you know, so I absolutely do have compassion, you know, for men who are who are in the middle of dismantling this and who are, you know, starting to recognize this in themselves. I absolutely do have compassion for that because it can feel like a, the smack in the face, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, there's so many things you just don't expect. And then it just, yeah. you know, smacks you. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. What is one action people could take from take away from this episode? Um, I'll give you a general one and a specific one in general okay. like if you're on social media which you know pretty much everyone is these days I go follow you know non-men polyamory creators I have gotten so much just information and you know it's been so much easier for me to work through my issues when I've just literally surrounded myself in the perspective <laughs> of people who are affected by my actions and by the actions of my gender, right? So just find, there are tons, I would say most polyamory creators, at least that I know and that I follow are women, you know, there's so many great resources. Um, and I would highly recommend, uh, and I will say I'm a little biased, the podcast, uh, Molding Masculinity. I'm a little biased because uh, I've been on it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, made by my friend, who I've known for like 10 years and I did the art for them. So it's like, I'm biased. But it's a great, it's a great show that like tackles these issues and like dismantles like, you know, episode by episode of like, let's talk about male anger. Let's talk about how toxic masculinity affects fatherhood, stuff like that. And it's, it's you know, molding masculinity is a, an absolutely fantastic resource to kind of at least start the conversation within yourself of tackling, you know, how, how do you even start? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Beautiful. Actions, Thank say. you. Those are great <laughs> actions. I love those actions. So awesome. hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our giveaway. Yes. 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 Do you want to share? Or you want me to share? I have it written down. Uh, go for it. Go for it. All right. Cool. So one lucky human will receive a hoodie, a shirt, and a make your own four pack of stickers, which they're so good. Oh my God. I love them so much. Okay. They can, again, my fangirl is going to come out here in a sec. <laughs> um, so uh, they can choose any design from Chad's website um, and the winner will get a promo code at checkout or get their choices and um, put the order in manually. Um, yes. so I don't, I'm not sure how logistically you want to get me that I can send you a code. I can, you know, whatever we need to do. Just let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so uh, <laughs> Jacob, our producer, um, is going to can you put out the number jacob yep got that on the screen for you 
Got, okay, the number's on the screen, yay. Okay, I can't see the screen, so I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob is on it, he's amazing. All right, the number is 1-800-930-2819, 1-800-930-2819. Um, and call in and then we will be able to get you connected to Chad and then he'll be able to get you the promo code. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sweet, perfect. That's exactly how that's going to work. Okay, and um, <laughs> and what you're promoting is your shop. Yes, I am recently uh, a, a bit of a bit of a weird story. Last year, I kind of quit my job for mostly mental health reasons at a at a time where I was not prepared to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, I was kind of having a little bit of an existential crisis about <laughs> I don't even want to do this shit anymore. Uh, so it was a real whirlwind. Uh, <laughs> but so now I have gotten to the point where I am, you know, a full time independent artist. And like, my designs, like, uh, man, I don't think I've ever said that like publicly before. Like I've said that where, wow. <laughs> you yeah, are. You're, I, say it so, again. Say it again. <laughs> so when you, you know, when you contribute, when you buy something from my shop, you're not just like, you know, oh, this is like a side thing. No, this is my thing. Like this is mm -hmm. I, like I, I like I am an artist, and my polyam fam shop is like the vast majority of like what you know, supports me. So um, also, uh, I just recently got uh, pins in enamel pins, hard enamel pins, and they sold out in like three days. Like I That's have I have a few of one of them left, but the other one's completely sold out. Um, and I have an email link if you really want one of those. And I will let those people on that email list know <laughs> first before anybody else gets to know that they're because I I reordered 700 of the things. <laughs> so. Wow, amazing. But yeah, All just right. take a look. Uh, I, I put a lot of love into my designs and like, you know, I like to think they're pretty good. <laughs> they're really good. I really like them. Like I said, super fangirl over here. And uh, um, what is the, what's the, your, your links are in the show notes. And so people can actually go and click on all of those links. But do you want to say the website out loud? Polyamfam.com <laughs> slash shop. Or if you just go to polyamfam.com, there will be like a shop tab up top. So polyamfam.com it'll get you there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Brilliant. Beautiful. Chad, thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank, thank you, you for, for having all me. Of, yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you for all of your insight and knowledge and experience and just your energy. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. All right. Well, for everyone who is listening or watching or however you are consuming this show right now, um, we love you. Thank you so much. And take on those actions, call the number and get the free giveaway and definitely go and check out Chad's shop at polyamfam.com slash shop. And we will see you next time on the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love. You have been listening to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Tune in live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on transformationtalkradio.com, where we shed light on relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Learn to love yourself and create the relationships you want. Connect with me at elizabethannecunningham.com. That's elizabethannecunningham.com.